Hello, I'm Jim Slavin, and this is All Hail to the Pod. Edinburgh is a city that everyone is familiar with, not just residents, but many of the visitors who travel here from throughout the world every year. They're familiar with its landmarks, they're familiar with its tourist industry, and with the university. And Edinburgh is changing, like many other cities. Every now and then, that change, and the social implications of that change, emerges, breaks through into public consciousness through various campaigns. Currently, the campaign to save Leaf Walk is creating one of those public debates. We're asking ourselves, who is the city for? James Connolly said, the city of Edinburgh belongs to the people of Edinburgh. Find Edinburgh University and its overreach and its power, and how the council were already acting like estate agents for the university. Today, Edinburgh University has a larger turnover than Manchester United. We'll never know what James Collin would have made of that, although we can guess. But to talk about some of these questions today, the pod sat down with radical art historian, activist and artist Stephen Pritchard for a fascinating interview looking at the Save Leaf Walk campaign, art washing, gentrification in Edinburgh and beyond. Hello Stephen, welcome to the pod. Hi. Uh, I'd just like to, before we begin properly, I first come across your work this summer with some of the stuff you've been doing in Leaf through I think initially through an article in Bella Caledonia, but yeah. could you maybe just give the listeners a, a sort of brief summary of the other things you've been involved in in your career before we got to the summer in Leaf? Oh. <laughs> briefly. Uh, yeah, very briefly. Yes, yeah, so I've been doing community art since 2007. Uh, there's a whole history before that, but I won't go into it. Um, but um, yeah, I've, I've been researching... Uh, a PhD level since 2016 um, and, and my work's around uh, my thesis is around art washing it's called art washing the art of regeneration social capital and anti-gentrification activism so it looks at it looks at how art's used um, in regards to, to uh, regeneration and gentrification um, it looks at um, what that's about how art, how art's been uh, co-opted in this in this sort of way uh, by developers and by councils and the state um on the one hand and it's also um looks at people who are resisting this process who are resisting not just art washing but resisting like gentrification and social cleansing of the houses and in in so many areas of this country and and the world um obviously people are being working class people are being um just cast aside in, in the you know uh, by 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 the develop by capitalism and development um and and unfortunately art's being used in that way an awful lot so i guess my work's around that um, in places like uh, london um particularly um i'm also interested in the work of in boyle heights in la and and various places around the world yep. but the focus is on the uk definitely yeah uh, maybe we could just start by unpicking some of the terms. We'll, we can get on the gentrification and its effects in Leaf and Edinburgh yeah. more generally in a minute. But what about art washing? Just for the listeners, art washing is one of these things <laughs> that you didn't notice it until yeah. it's pointed out to you. And then yeah. once you understand what's happening, you see it everywhere. So could you maybe just briefly explain a bit what you mean by art washing? Yeah, art washing is when art is used as a veneer or a gloss um, for, 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 for capitalism effectively so it's not just about gentrification so a classic example i guess the first time art washing was really used would be around um on the one hand it was around uh, social housing in london around balfron tower um in poplar in east london but also it's also um being used by uh, the art not oil campaigns the uh, drop bp campaigns um around the big galleries uh, national galleries and the tate around the use of BP and um, oil. And so it can be used as like corporates yep. to hide corporates um, social responsibility. So BP dress up the fact that basically they're polluting and destroying the entire planet and exploiting the world's natural resources and, and being huge contributors to climate change by showing that they also support great art in, in, and, and that that's problematic. And obviously there, were, there, there, there was a, uh, there's a, a resistance to that and that resistance really becomes the the, the foundation of what art, of it, it on the one hand it defined art washing and on the other hand it also defined how to oppose that process and that it made it began to bring pe make people aware of it increasingly now art washing is used um by developer property developers um to 
put up uh, to to put um, murals, banksies on the side of buildings, yep. uh, street art that looks really cool. Um, ahead of any development on the side of buildings that are probably going to be knocked down soon. And the idea there is is just to say, oh look look at this, isn't it a cool area? But really, it's acting as a signpost to developers to say and to, to middle class people to say this is an area that's going to be really somewhere you want to invest in soon. And so effectively, it's it's. It's hiding, it's masking yep. these things, and in its worst form, it is when commun when artists, community artists like me, although I don't do that sort of thing, hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> um, come in are used by councils and by the state to actually go into communities, into into estates, into schemes, and actually say, "Oh, hi, we're working. We want to do an art project with you," and they begin doing these things like sto story harvesting, taking people's stories. Yep and memories and family histories and turning them into like museum objects which are then shown in this context of oh look at these working class people isn't it lovely when all the time the, the immediate plan is to pretty much displace them yeah, amazing, yeah. and then they might leave some small trace of highly sanitized and edited memories from working class people these sort of like uh, uncivilized others in their mind um, as like a little, a little um, a way of commemorating what was once here, uh, uh, which the middle classes find really nice because they love a bit of nostalgia. Yeah. So that's sort of all the ways in which art washing can be used. So it's art being used to hide and mask uh, much more divisive and exploitative capitalist processes. And one of the examples I've seen in one of the articles uh, you've written was about local authority art washing was in mm. St. Pauli in Hamburg. Yeah. So St. Pauli would be an area that and the football team would be, in, would be something that would be in the consciousness of our listeners and people Aye. would be aware of it. And it's somewhere people think of as being sort of edgy, counterculture. Mm -hmm. And it was quite striking to read a different perspective on it, that actually yeah. art washing was a major part of that and yeah. the state and state planning was was about so was that about them incorporating that counterculture in some way or yeah or is it, or even or is it really just about land and property and capitalism in its rawest form uh no this was very much uh it's a classic it's a, it's one of the, the the ones that i like to tell because yep. i think that it's really really useful uh in the uk in Sco in scotland in edinburgh at the moment because what it is about is on the one hand it, it appears that there's a group of anti-gentrification activists, squatters, artists, um, rising up against the city, against the city authorities, Hamburg state, state authorities, um, and, and demanding a park in an area that was, was earmarked for gentrification and, and actually winning and getting a park, mm -hmm. right? And having raves on it and, and, and all these sorts of things. But, the, the, the reality is really very different. So, and the clue is in the name Park Fiction. And just like Pulp Fiction, is it's a clever, ironic, postmodern take on things in that it is a fiction. The, the story of how the park came to be is a fiction. This was planned and it was planned by the Hamburg authorities and the Hamburg authorities actually um, employed the artists behind park fiction to um to create a gritty um alternative participatory sort of veneer for for a park which was always going to be a park um and so to to in in and in the end they paid they gave 2.3 million euros to park fiction to build the park the park is today um a really nice place people come there from all over the world it's full of middle class people and it's surrounded now by middle class eateries and bars and apartments it's it's it's, it's marketed by um hamburg as one of its cool places in mm -hmm. sao sao pa sao Paulo. um and yet yet the story that's that's around it is this fictitious tale of resistance and gentrification but in a way what that does is it actually destroys it destroys real working class um the, the it destroys the, the the potential for working class people to feel that they can um independently rise up yeah. 
and take and, and, and say no because what this was was a case of what seemed to be saying no but really they were just saying yes to the council's plans all along and that for me is a classic case of art washing and it's deeply manipulative. Yeah, I found it fascinating as well. And you say there's a lot of uh, parallels with things that you can see happening in Edinburgh and mm. other places that are, I'm involved in as well. Mm. So that brings us to this. You mentioned the, the creatives, and mm -hmm. I feel like I should put that in inverted commas, but yeah. the creative <laughs> types. Mm -hmm. And partly what's happening, to bring it back to Leaf, where you're doing some work just now, uh -huh. partly what's happening down there is about creating these creative hubs and cultural hubs, and there's various other things happening. But you mentioned mm. the word independent as well. Mm -hmm. And I suppose... Once you look beyond the rhetoric, a lot yeah. of these things are state funded as well. Yeah. So they are not independent, they're not bottom up, they're not necessarily working class arts no. and working class artists, we believe. Mm. Uh, so could you just say a bit about that? Because people mm. wouldn't be aware of that. There's so much of that going on that we're creating this space for artists and that place for a creative hub. And yeah. What's actually happening there? Yeah. Well, I mean, this ties in, I think it's fair to say it's, it's worth linking that to Hamburg yep. because the mayor of Hamburg was well known for carrying round a Bible, a book, and that Bible was the Bible of creativity. And what that was, was um, the cre was creative cities or the creative class. And it was, it's, it's a series of books by Richard Florida, who basically is single-handedly responsible for, the, for creative clusters, for creative industries, for the model that's basically universally applied around the world um, as to bring in creatives, create zones, create clusters, um, bring in the creatives, followed by the hipsters, income the middle class, the bohemians, the, the cultured classes, and suddenly the economy of the city will bloom and blossom and everything will be great. What, what they didn't realise, and what people still don't realise is, is last year Richard Florida himself, in his latest book, actually finally an, re, um, uh, announced that his work up to that point promoting these clusters, these creative zones, this cultural class, creative class, creates gentrification and displaces working class people. And he said that, yet still the policy in Hamburg was to use this creative class model. They invited Richard Florida over several times to talk to the people yep. who were involved in park fiction. And what we see in Leith is exactly that. We're talking about blueprints. We're talking about, now we're talking about the, the new investment with the, air, the the government investment on a creative cluster with Edinburgh University, which actually, a lot of which is gonna happen down in Leith as well. Um, and this is around this idea, these words, this terminology is the language of the creative class of, and creative cities. It's the language of Richard Florida. What that language is about is the state, just like in Hamburg, um, paying the state, the local councils, uh, businesses, uh, paying for artists to come in and perhaps do fake uh, uh, consultations. They often call it these days creative placemaking. And, and that's a, a deeply problematic term because obviously places exist people exist in these places yeah. they don't need making they're made already <laughs> right what they're talking about is is this process of middle class white male able-bodied right um place making remaking a place for the middle classes yeah. and what that what that does yet it often it, it's hidden because no one wants to say it yeah is it's going to take out the small businesses, it's going to take out the um, working class people, working class pubs, right? It's going to get rid of all of the, 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 real, um, the real cultures, the cultures, not culture, yeah. the different cultures that exist to make a place like in Leith. And no one cares and it creates a blueprint, a, homog a standard sort of um, idea of, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we had bagels and hipsters and, and things like that? And, and, and having worked in Leith, what I see is, is that these people, right, are middle class. They're, 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 they're all part of a network, they're part of Creative Edinburgh, they're part of the, the cultural network of Edinburgh, which is itself deeply middle class. It's dripping with middle, with, with middle class privilege. And they've come into an area which has been earmarked as a, a corridor, effectively, Leith Walk, yeah. to the outlier, which is the port, 
And now they're working on these ideas around making it really cool. And, and, and every day, just the other day in the newspaper, Brian Ferguson's saying, oh, look at this, Leith is just named as basically one of the coolest places on earth, right? It's got hipsters, it's got, and it's got grassroots community art. It's got everything. <laughs> And I think that that's problematic. And when you speak to the grass to people who are grassroots artists in Leith, they can't get any work because no one who's involved in this creative city sham wants working class artists who might speak a different language, who might have different um, aims and objectives, who might care about the local people and the communities because they are from that community. They don't want that. So instead, they're sidelined. No money for you. Be quiet. And that's the sort of situation that I'm at at, at the moment with Leith, and I think it's deeply worrying, really. And of course, gentrification itself is a, a process that goes on over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And there was one of these terms that came out of the United States, um, and it still has a bit of currency in, in France, interesting enough, Bobos, mm -hmm. the bohemian yeah, yeah. bourgeois. And so is that what we're talking about here, that we're going through that phase? And I mean, in the old town, we are sitting here in County mm -hmm. HQ, yeah. and the, the old town has had a different experience. It was much Aye. quicker, less art washing, but almost thoroughly complete is the process of social change and mm. transformation here. But in Leaf, I work that process just now that other cities have, have been through where the creatives, yeah. these these bobos, are yeah. being used as part of the initial stage of gentrification. Yes, I think it's quite clear that that is what's happening. Um, I think that um, these bobos, of course, um, and I write about this myself in, in work that I call New Bohemias, and it's the idea around the new bohemians, these bobos, and just like the old bohemians, right, they play at being working class, they play at being of the community, but they don't understand it. All they understand is a parody of it, an ironic twist on what they, they think is the community and also what that community should look like. Um, and, and what that ultimately is about, it's safe for them to be bo bobos, right? Because they're middle class, just like the old bohemians, they play bit slumming it for a while in their eyes that's not my term that's how i think they would say it but all the time they have the safety nets behind them of their parents of privilege of of networks right that means that once they've done it for a bit you know maybe they'll become famous and and then they can just move on um if it all goes wrong then there's always other avenues to go to. They can always, in fact, you know, they can maybe they can get a job as a curator in a gallery or whatever because their friends will make sure that happens and they all laugh and joke about how nice it was in those days when we when we, we slummed it down in, in Leith and, and, and ultimately got paid quite handsomely to help the council and the um, Scottish government to make this place, in their words, make Leith better. Mm make leaf better the bobos have made leaf better how wonderful because leaf needed to be made better who d says that it needs to be made better who decides these things this is the question that i think and so for me it's nice being a bobo and just like the littlest hobo of the, the, of the classic american um tale their uh, film uh, tv program sorry um the bobos, just like the littlest hobo, just keep moving on. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting you're talking about make life better and that sense of change and transformation. And of course, what is a lot of gentrification, mm. one of the core elements here is they're making the place nicer, looks better, cleaner, mm. but for different people altogether. No, for yeah. the residents that live there initially yeah. with roots and networks of solidarity and families, mm -hmm. they'll be moved on as part of that, that transformation. Mm -hmm. One of our interesting things that I've uh, noticed with the in Leaf that's happening is this has been a long process for the waterfront and as you say, mm. they're creating that corridor. Mm -hmm. So there's been many gap sites, many developments, the student accommodation, there's been many displacements yeah. of working class people throughout yeah. Leaf, but mm -hmm. particularly if you come down the walk. Yeah. And there wasn't these campaigns before, so there's this one campaign that seems yeah. to be focused on the drum development yeah. and uh, save the Leaf Depot, yeah. which, which is which is fine if people there are only happy with that development. Yeah. But surely, is it connected to any broader movement arguing for public housing, for instance? Um, no, it's not. Um, quite the opposite. It literally, Save Leaf Walk uh, campaign literally uh, 
is isn't really about leaf walk. Um, um, it's about saving uh, Stead's place, uh, one part of Leith Walk. Um, and even then, I'm not really sure if it's really about saving Stead's place, as in keeping it the way it was. I think it's the, the, the campaign acknowledges that the, the, the development will happen. Um, and I think that, I think that, I don't know what, it, it, perhaps it's campaigning to keep the shops open um, and for some slightly different form of development from happening there uh, than, than what's already going on. So it's not connected to broader campaigns. It's some, it could be, it should be perhaps. It does, I, it's certainly, from what I hear, not interested in social housing, never mind council housing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mention affordable housing, but that's very, very different. Yeah. Uh, and I think, um, I think that you need to look at the, uh, I would argue you need to look at whether this is actually a campaign. I'm hearing the word that, that Save Leith Walk has activists, and I'm not really sure, like in my sense of what an activist is, and po politically, I'm not sure what that, what that really means. I mean, when you've got councillors and all sorts of architects who are involved in like ideas around like gentrifying the walk, supposedly campaigning against the council uh, uh, and all the developers. I think that that's pro like seems to me to be slightly problematic. That's not to take away the fact that you know that, that positively Save Leaf Walk has, has generated a lot of support, although how much of that supports from uh, local people, people living in the um, estates or many of the small business owners uh, or people working with community groups around off, off from the walk and around Leaf beyond, I'm not really too sure. Um, but it has galvanised, it has the potential, it has the brand, right? To It had the brand and I, it's in real danger of losing that of being something that could really build a positive, make positive statements for, for, for the sort of accepting that some regeneration is needed, right? That bec to help help develop the city so that some rich people might need to come in and, and buy luxury flats. But at the same time, that trade up, there has to be a clear trade off. It's not, it needs to, it needs to invest that money from the wealthy coming in into a truly mixed community that welcomes in newcomers but on the, on the terms of the people who already live there. And I call that place garden. Mm -hmm. And the idea being that the, that the people who've generations and generations of Leithas, right, have got nothing to do with the creative industries. They're not consulted by Save Leaf Walk, particularly, they're not involved in it. And yet what people want is, is that doesn't matter. The working class people, that their voices are not heard by anybody in these processes. Yet for me, these are the people who, who need to, who need to have investment to help make sure that they can stay living there, that they've got jobs, that their kids have got decent schools, that, they, that, that they've, they've got good transport links, and that ultimately they're benefiting from the, from the redevelopment of, of Edinburgh, or Le and, and in this case Leith, not just being kicked out and moved to the outskirts of the city, yeah, I think, I mean, Edinburgh, Leaf Edinburgh certainly needs a campaign for more public housing, and I mean public housing. Yeah. And also, I get the feeling when I'm in Leaf, it is a sort of goodwill towards a campaign that is about saving Leaf or saving Leaf Walk from totally. gentrification. Mm -hmm. But I think people would maybe, certainly the working class people I speak to in Leaf, they view that as being a struggle against what's happening. Yeah. And they're only confused and they're only kidded on at all by the fact that councillors are trying to get on aye, and aye. play both sides. <laughs> One of the, the, the best examples of that was when they put up the, a letter on the outside the way it's got to be demolished and aye. saying all oh, of us should the shop should be open until they're demolished type thing. And it was signed by all the councillors, yeah. SNP ones, Green ones, Labour ones. MSPs and SNP has been in power 11 and a half years. Yeah. Labour and the SNP are in coalition together. Yeah. The Greens support the SNP up until this year, certainly on budgets. Yeah. So these parties are all key to yeah. the policy frameworks that have been developed and yeah. to the political decisions. Yeah. So surely some sort of independent campaign should be focused on that and the power relationships rather than focusing just on one development. Yeah, definitely. And I think that, that that's something that, that that's what I'm trying to, to get across because you know, um, you're right, all the political parties are in cahoots here and have been for quite a long time. In the case of Stead's Place, the one that Save Leith Walk is focusing on, 
the the plan the the per permitted development was um development was permitted in 2008 by the city council and that means that they actively since then have asked people developers to come and build on that they've made change of use and and as you say all the, the different political parties are involved in this and i think that i think this is something that that's at the core of of the problems that we face that we face in Edinburgh, that we face across the UK, if not globally, and that is this: there's a lack of really radical political alternatives out there. And I think most people, working class people particularly, want that alternative. They see through this. They see through the 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 student housing going up everywhere, the Nando's and the blinking um, Starbucks and whatever you've got. They see through that. They feel. That there's that, that and, and in many places in my research in London, people are really and and, and in Leith are really worried. And Tierra as well are worried about what's going to happen to the schemes, their estates. What what? There's nobody wants to talk about 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 protecting and and caring for those people who make up the majority of our populations, who who actually who are at the core of our cultures and our histories and heritage. Right, whose stories are the most important stories, right? And yet we've always been silenced through history. We've always been oppressed. And for me, the problem that I see is that many of these campaigns are, are co-opted by politicians, they're co-opted by others, and, and led by middle class people to 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 speak on behalf of local people, and they're never really actually asking people what they really want. And I think until we get to a, a situation where we, we have a radical form of participatory democracy, real participatory democracy, where people listen to that, where where plans are made, they're not drafts are not handed to people for consultation, where plans are made by local people who live about what they want to see happen in their area and how much money they need to make their lives the, uh, livable and to make their community somewhere where they can feel like safe and secure in rather than constantly threatened by the fact that one day you may get a compulsory purchase order through your door or you might just have the bulldozers round do you know what i mean and i think i think that there's something that it's at the core of our society and our our political system when when people are just basically cast aside by all sorts of political parties in cahoots ultimately focusing with nothing more than seeing dollar signs in their eyes and pound signs the euros one of the interesting things that you hear all the time in politics especially uh, in the media is about how do we get working class people engaged in politics why are working mm. class people voting for brexit or mm. trump or why are they going to you know these sort of anti-muslim mm. rallies and yeah. following uh, you know sort of opportunist people on, mm. on social media or whatever but one of the things you hear if you go and actually listen to working class people is they say that, well, the problem is the political parties are all the same. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter who we vote and mm -hmm. they're going to do this anyway. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And and in many ways, Edinburgh is a perfect example of that mm -hmm. because, of course, we operate within the, the national question where everything is viewed through that prism. Mm -hmm. So that is a distinctive feature between the SNP and Labour. Aye. But if you look at Edinburgh, they are in coalition together. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are the ones implementing these policies in many yeah. respects in terms of planning and development, acting as estate agents to sell off the mm -hmm. land around the boot places. So these are parties who are not contesting politics, mm -hmm. they're colluding with each other mm -hmm. to exclude working class people. Completely. And working class people can see that. Yeah. They see that right away, they recognise it. So we definitely need to have some campaigns that are independent of these political parties and processes mm -hmm. and that are holding them accountable for the decisions they're making. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the fact that some of the campaigns are led by middle class people. Yeah. What I find fascinating as well is there's a, there's a quite rightly, and I support it, there's a campaign in the old town just now against the Airbnb and short term lets mm -hmm. because of the, what it's doing to the, the area. Yeah. And that's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. But the people leading the campaign are themselves gentrifiers. Mm -hmm. But there's no self awareness of that on their part. These are mm -hmm. gentrifiers complaining about gentrification. Yeah. And this is against a global phenomenon. There's a yeah. great book, uh, Good Neighbours, I think it was called, I'll put a mm -hmm. link up to it on the social media, uh, about gentrification in Boston with the same yeah. processes are happening so is that how you see it in Leaf as well as, as somebody who's been doing work there is, is, is exactly the same as what's happening and can we not learn some lessons for elsewhere and try and find a way to actually get 
working <laughs> class people engaged in this? Well, yeah, I would say definitely. Um, so what you, you 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 hit the nail on the head there. I mean, um, it is middle class, often well meaning. Yep. Yep. Uh, do gooding middle class people going and up and thinking, oh, we need to do something here. They they tend to be the complainers or the ones. That's not fair. Everybody complains. Working class people complain. We complain all the time in the pub, in the streets to each other. We try and ca complain to councils and they just ignore us. Middle class people, artists, creatives, right? People with a bit of government funding are listened to a lot more. And 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 also others who, who have vested interests, like say, say they, they own houses around here, or flats, apartments, um, and they're not happy about Airbnb because they don't want transient people, the middle classes, they want they want good, quiet neighbours who, who who can be trusted and they don't really want to know them that well. They want to keep themselves themselves. But what they don't want is random people coming in drunk and staying for the weekend and being noisy because it's, it's, it's just an Airbnb place. It, it, that's not what they want. So they'll complain about these things and they'll be listened to, perhaps. Um, and I think, that, I think that's, that's definitely problematic. But I think that in terms of uh like uh, w working class campaigns i think there's an awful lot that needs to be done um i'm a momentum activist um and i know that's problematic in scotland <laughs> uh, and england perhaps <laughs> to <some laughs> people but i think that we're making progress in helping in changing things and that's not to say the momentum isn't uh uh heavily led by middle class people as well because it sort of is um, and sometimes, some sometimes that's how things often start. I mean, you could go, we could go into Marx and all the rest of it, but like, but certainly the key, my my main um, interest here is in in all that work that I'm doing around movement for cultural democracy, and I'm interested in cultural democracy and participatory democracy as a radical um, socialist uh, Marxist position, and, and I guess what what that means to me and many others is around um, completely rethinking um, how we do everything in this, in, in our countries, in our communities, um, and how we, and, 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 and enabling people to be, people should be the, should decide on the majority of things, particularly at a local level. Um, uh, and the idea of, and I think the problem we've got is representational democracy. It's been around for far too long, right? And before that, God, we had even worse situations, right? But let's 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 understand that when a representational democracy means people of all types, but particularly working class people who are perhaps the furthest away from the seat of power of representational democracy, um, feel that they've got no voice, and therefore participatory democracy is about changing that around and saying, you know what? It's you tell us what you want, and we or the system will do that for you. And it's about, it's about that. I think it's about, and that's a, there's a big reawakening needs to happen because for so long people have been suppressed and oppressed by this system that says we know best. And if you do try and rise up, just look what happens, right? We'll shut you up and not so long ago, we'll gun you down. And that is, and now what we see in the cultural industry, the soft power alternative of this gunboat diplomacy approach um, is to say, you want to be involved in this creative industries, you play by our rules. We, you, so art washing becomes part of that. So it is all the other things that we've talked about, the forms of culture, how culture is used. But in this soft power approach, you must play by our rules. You, so you do what we say, or you won't get any money. You won't be able to make a living. You'll be ostracized by the creative community. And, and, and effectively, that, that type of approach is pretty much reproducing the oppression uh, within the creative class yeah. of the working class. Yeah. And so we see the cycle perpetuated again. And so it's very much about breaking that cycle. And it's very, very much about the long 
revolution. I think yeah. I don't. I'm, I'm a I'm a great believer in uh, Raymond Williams and, and 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 the idea and and the Frankfurt School ideas around um, about these things are going to take time, but we have to start to challenge. Like you say, we need we need a challenge. We need to highlight what's going on. People need we need a system of education. People need to see through. The, the the lies that are being told yeah. by the city council by the the the, the government um who on the one hand say oh yes we care about you and on the other quite clearly are exploiting you and selling the land from under our feet yeah it's, it's interesting one of the and just with the time we've got left mm -hmm. one of the ways that i've noticed the shut down debate about the type of change that's happening with gentrification it happened in mm. the old town and it's happening i think in leaf as well mm. is to say well look we're becoming more diverse is that not a great thing that we're more diverse mm -hmm. which completely omits the fact that the working class has always been multiracial yeah. and multi-ethnic yeah but also it omits the other part about exploitation and oppression that you're talking about that Yes, a global economy means that we're more mm. diverse, but we're also mm. more unequal. Mm -hmm. So we're becoming very similar in European economies to how it is in the United States. So there is diversity, but yeah. there's also a greater scale of inequality. Yeah. And perhaps we should be looking more at the economic inequality rather than promoting the diversity as being a great outcome in itself. Yeah. But what also, just in terms of the, the criticism you've had for, for saying some of the things that you've been saying. <laughs> what I've noticed is a lot of the criticism has focused on the fact that you're North of Scotland, that you're aye, English. Aye. And it seems to me there's, there's a limit on the, how, how much diversity they want in this debate and how exactly. much diversity. So what do you make of that, though, in terms of, I mean, maybe the substance of the criticism, what do you make of that? But also, what do you make of the, the, this, this attack on you because you're North of Scotland? That seems very odd for these people. <laughs> I think that it's... Um, uh, I think it comes to something if the best uh, response that you can make to to what it you know to to pretty much arguments that I'm making, which are, are fairly well accepted, right in in within academia and within large parts of 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 other places, right? That this isn't some sort of um, crackpot scheme I've got here, right? I'm not, in a lot of it's not my work. I'm just putting this together, right? And, and, and applying it to a situation to suddenly to be, to be, to be put, to be attacked for being from, not from Scotland, right? Some sort or a savior, this self anointed savior, right? I'm sorry, but I'm not a savior. I can't save. I've got, this isn't, this isn't my fight. I'm here to try and help. I've been asked to come by certain people, right? Um, and, and help educate, begin the process of opening up a discussion. And I think that that's, that's an important thing to do. Um, and that's got nothing to do with coming as a, as a colonizer <laughs> or, a, or, you know, or a, because I'm not. I support independence, I support Scotland, I support, I support diversity. And di I, I prefer the word difference. I say there's a lot of difference within communities, within our, what we class as a country. Right, as countries, and, and, and for me, I don't class, I'm not particularly happy to be considered English, right? And that's another whole issue, right? Um, but also, you know, I'm, I'm from Newcastle, right? And most, and many people in Newcastle don't consider, aren't happy to be called or labeled as part of the English, right? There's a whole load of complicated stuff going on, but for people to, to draw that down to, he's not from this country, you don't know anything about Leith, right? These sort of derogatory co comments, it's just quite petty and childish, I think. And I think that, to go to your other point there about um, diversity, I would argue that in a global system, in what we have is a transnational or global sort of neoliberal, uh, almost global one world order that we're in which there is no alternative. It's ironic how diversity is used. And I would argue that we're less diverse under a neoliberal system than ever before. There is no alternative, they tell us. Their version of diversity is conformity. And it becomes this double speak, this news speak, where on the one, yeah, we're more diverse than ever before. We're more um, able to, to move through the class barriers than ever before. No, we're not. We might not be, I don't know whether we ever have been, uh, able to particularly move um, and I think that that needs to change but I think that um, the I, I think that the real 
to go back to my point around social capital, the, the idea around this, what is good social capital? This being when people have good networks, uh, 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 good communities, right, who care for each other and all the rest of it. And in, in, in neoliberal social capital theory says, oh, middle class people, people who volunteer, who keep libraries open, who keep the streets clean for free, right? These things, this is, this is good social capital. Who, who don't cause trouble. I would argue, and others in other countries suggest that that's quite the opposite. I see the real social, diverse sense of, of strength and community spirit on the estates, in the schemes, right? In poorer countries, developing countries, right? Where people care for each other and stand for each other. And yeah, yeah, it, it can be tough living, right? For in the eyes of middle class people, of course, or a bit scary, which really is, again, they're, they're um, imposing their own norms upon working class lives, which are very norms, which are very different. And I would say that in those working class, uh, in working class areas and, and th our cultures, our norms, right? Are far stronger than middle class norms in reality and it's only through the constant political oppression right of working class people around the world right that we have been kept in our place occasionally we rise up but the whole system here whether it's neoliberalism feudalism whatever capitalism is about keeping us down and keeping us quiet and so that and and just and, and breaking solidarity and what I see in Leith, what I see in Edinburgh, what I see all over the world, to be fair, at the moment, is councils, polit politicians of all creeds, right, coming, businesses coming together. But ultimately, it's the politicians, local and national, who are in, who are colluding to suppress and oppress working class people and treat them with complete disdain to the point where oh we've marked on the map now of edinburgh that leith's going to be the, one of the coolest places in the world in our mind that means thanks for living there all those um years when we would never even go down there because we thought it was far too unsafe and dangerous when really it wasn't but like that's the myth thanks for making it so um make, making it so gritty but now we're here it's worth lots of money and you need to move out to Granton to to possibly we might if you're lucky we might build you some council housing or social housing on top of weight polluted wasteland that'd be nice but that's the future then that says a lot about about what these people think about about um our communities they, they, in london they literally dispersing people across the uk i'm working in county durham in mining villages where people from London who've lived there all their lives have been moved, sent to, to a, a train station, have been given a ticket to a train station and are now living in a category, X category day mining village, which is basically somewhere that has been left by the state for 70 years to rot. And they're being cast aside because they don't have any money. And in the neoliberal system, they don't matter. And I think that's something that we seriously need to address. And I think that's a point where we must start to organise around and understand why should why should we be pushed out by these people? And that's not to say they shouldn't come in. We shouldn't be welcoming because we are welcoming. Working class people can be very welcoming. We're not saying we don't want any rich people coming in. We're just saying, can't we live together? Why does that mean we have to en masse be kicked out? And that's not fair. These are certainly issues that are impacting on the working class across the country and across mm -hmm. the world. And the quicker we come up with some working class solutions to them, the better. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. for that reason, you'll always be very welcome, mm -hmm. irrespective of where you're from, in the Cowgate Republic. Stephen, <laughs> thanks very much for your <laughs> time. Ne Neva cheers. Thanks for listening. You can follow All Hail to the Pod on social media for updates regarding this episode and forthcoming episodes. All Hail to the Pod is a Cowgate Media production. For more information, visit 107cowgate.com.